exposures. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a lot for the liquids. Very much appreciate it. Came all the way from Kroningen here, so uh, so I needed some. Um, yeah. Cool introduction from from all of you. Uh, I, I don't have a talk about anything with a cool logo, so I borrowed three from from what I'm what I'm building on. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, PySpark Cassandra. Um, it's a it's a combination of, of using PySpark and, and Cassandra. Basically, that's it. Uh, very short about me. Uh, my name is Frans. Uh, Frans, something like that for the foreigners on you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a database processing guy at a small group called Target Holding in, uh, in Groningen. Uh, and, and, and that's my email address. I don't, I don't do Twitter. Uh, <laughs> well, not anymore, anyway. Uh, a small word about Target Holding. Uh, we're an analytics group. Uh, 25 people, something like that. Spin-off from University in Groningen. I think about two-thirds of us have an AI background. The rest of us are well, database processing type of guys, some web devs around, and that, that sort of stuff. Cool small uh, group, having a lot of fun in, uh, in Groningen. Uh, we work a lot with, uh, with time series. Um, we, we, we started off with some, some research in, in that area in, well, in, the, in the University of Groningen where we spin off, span off. Uh, we do some prediction stuff, some search and time series, anomaly detection, that sort of things. Uh, we do a lot of text mining uh, and matching. Uh, mm -hmm. We're in the HR business, uh, resumes and, and jobs, uh, trying to match those, that, that sort of stuff. Um, just giving you know, to, to the market, that was HR. Uh, and media, we track a lot of uh, YouTube, uh, iTunes, uh, what, what, what have you, online channels for, uh, for a big uh, uh, publisher. Uh, a music uh, brand, uh, infrastructure, uh, energy, waterworks, that sort of stuff. We do monitoring and all well, the things on the left for, uh, for that. Um, and, and, and health is a business we're trying to get a foothold in, but well, not so easy. Um, why Spark Cassandra? Um, I, I don't know what, what the, the level of expertise or knowledge about the, the, the tech I'm, I'm talking about is. So maybe a show of hands who, who has worked with Spark or most of you have, could. Uh, PySpark? Uh, Halfish? Cassandra, anyone? And now the, the big question, have you worked with the combination of the three of them? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, I thought as much, I thought as much. I, I do have some stars and that sort of things and uh, a bunch of clones on GitHub and whatnot and there are some, some guys in uh, China and Germany and whatnot that are filing issues and hopefully not all my users are, are filing issues but uh, it, it's, it's not so big, big as the names we've, uh, we've heard before, but uh, well, still, I, I, I hope it's a, it's a fun talk. Um, I'll, I'll start off with, with getting some things out of the way about Cassandra, about Spark, about PySpark, so we're, well, not on the same page, but at least have some common understanding of, of the three. Uh, and then I'll go into PySpark Cassandra itself, uh, show some features, some use cases, what we're doing with it. Uh, a brief getting started, what, what's it about? Um, the, well, basically there are a bunch of operators uh, in PySpark Cassandra, uh, and I want to talk about that. So it's a bit of a techie talk. I, I, I hope you're bearing with me. It's, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's getting boring, let, let me know, drink beer, whatever. Yeah? And uh, if you have questions, please, please do, uh, do ask. Uh, well, there were some of you that know Cassandra, but uh, a bit of background. It's a distributed database. It's not a relational thing, even, so it's a NoSQL database. It originated at Facebook, um, has its roots in, uh, in Amazon Dynamo. Uh, today, it has a sort of a SQL feel. Uh, years ago, it was a, a lot rougher, and, and under the hood, it's most certainly not SQL, but it has a, a SQL-ish. So you can insert into and select from and update and delete and that sort of uh, stuff, uh, create tables and indexes and what well, you call them types or numbers and floats and text and that sort of stuff. So if you're first starting out with Cassandra, it sort of feels like a regular database <coughs> and then all of a sudden you know that it can do stuff that normal databases can't and then you notice that it can't do stuff that normal databases do. Um, 
that's because it's a distributed and replicated database uh, that makes things easier in terms of uh, uh, failover and, and dealing with machines going, that, that sort of stuff, going missing. Um, the, the, under the hood, at, at least up until Cassandra 3, some things have changed, but basically the conceptual model behind Cassandra was a map of ordered maps. That, that's sort of what your primitive was. You have a key by which your data is distributed among the cluster, uh, which consists of maps where the keys are your columns and the rest are rows. That, that's sort of a way of understanding Cassandra. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I do geen rechten aan Cassandra, or I don't know what the English translation for that would be, but uh, it, it sort of gives a, a hook for understanding. So, uh, it uses consistent hashing, so when a machine goes, it's not like your mod n goes minus one, and then you have to reshuffle everything. Each and every node in a Cassandra cluster has positions. Today they're multiple, they used to have only one position, but they have positions in a key space. Uh, Cassandra has a 64-bit key space, so every node has a number of spots on that key space for which it is responsible. So if you have a key, you hash it or you use some partitioner, you know what node is responsible for storing that content. Um, and you replicate along the ring. So if you have replication factor of three, so you can have one missing, uh, for instance, then you would have a hashed key, then you know where the first node would be, and then the next one and the next one after that would be the, the, the three nodes where you would be storing your data. That's sort of a brief intro into Cassandra, is it? Am I going too fast? Is that stupid? There's a bunch of stuff going on within a node. I'll be very brief about that. It, Cassandra is kind of okay for, for writing to it a lot uh, because it's a sort of a, well, append only. It, at least it doesn't modify a, a B plus tree in place and all that sort of stuff. You write into a mem table and a, and a commit log and all of, at some point in time your mem table is full. You flush it out of disk and once in every while you pack up a bunch of SS tables and you group it into a bigger one. There Again, a, a, a lot of things that are actually a lot more compl complicated than what I'm telling you now, but that's sort of what it boils down to. There are a number of caches. And, uh, indexing is, uh, is, is getting, well, some foothold within Cassandra, apart from, of course, the indexing in the map of unordered map uh, conceptual model, because that's, it's a, well, is an index. You have a key, and you know where to go, which node you, you need to go to read from and then in that second layer of order perhaps you also know, need you know where you need to go to, to read them. So that's your primary index. So, so in Cassandra land they talk about secondary indexes. Um, Cassandra 3 has some nice features uh, for that but maybe that's something for a, for a Cassandra meetup. Um, enough about Cassandra, any questions? Good. Sorry? Did you try to use uh, materialized keys feature of anywhere? Uh, no, I haven't yet. No. No. I use manual uh, secondary indexes, but haven't used materials, materialized views yet. We're still on Cassandra 2.2 for the majority of our infrastructure, and no, I have not used secondary indexes. I have an issue for PySpark Cassandra that doesn't work with, with materialized views. <laughs> Uh, and that's a dependency somewhere, but uh, uh, no, no, I, I haven't. No. Have you? Uh, no, I'm afraid to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It has some benefits, makes things easier, but there are also, again, always when someone else does, does your work, it, there are risks involved. It was a. Yeah, sure question on the real life views. I can look it up myself. Do you have a one-liner for it? Uh, basically, what you um, what you have is a very fast path in getting one cell out of Cassandra, because you have these two layers of maps, and then you, you you sort of immediately know where to get data from. If you don't, in normal databases, you have something like a, a like a secondary index, a, a B plus tree, or uh, you can scan over the the, the primary index or that, that that sort of stuff. Uh, in Sandra, you, 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 you don't, so you build views which are uh, 
you reshuffle your data instead of having your customers ordered by their user ID, you have a table with their email address and their username. So you can immediately, taking their email address, look up their username. Instead of in the normal table, you would have your username and you would immediately get to, well, whatever you store for a you. So materialized view is sort of like a secondary index. And in Cassandra, to two and lower, you would have to build that yourself. So every time a user registers, you write to two tables, one being the user table and the other being your materialized view where you swap username and, and, and email then. And Cassandra 3 brings you a feature where this is done for you. You also have uh, secondary indexes in 2.2, but they are a completely different beast and they have some scaling issues in their certain, certain, certain some circumstances that works, but not for the username email. Uh, of course, there's data stack search uh, in, in data stacks enterprise, uh, and there's a Cassandra Lucene index by Statio, so there, there are other types of secondary indexes uh, popping up for another talk. Spark. Well, most hands went up about Spark, so you know what an RDD is, data frame, data set, that sort of stuff. You know about the transformations, I assume, being wide or narrow. You've seen this image a million times because you can't look up Spark without seeing that image, probably. This sort of is clear, probably, also. You have a driver where your application sort of starts and you claim resources in a cluster, and that's managed by something, be it Yarn, be it Mesos, be it, be it Cassandra, Cassandra, be it Spark, uh, standalone master. Um, right, this is, this is clear, I can skip that. Uh, a few words about PySpark. Um, we, we're, a, we're a Python group. We, we, we started off with the, the web part being PHP, but uh, when I joined the group, that, that sort of, well, was muffled away and we only do Python in our development. Uh, and that's a good thing because everyone speaks the same language and it's, it's all nice, especially if you have a small group with 25 people. It's, it's nice if everyone can sort of understand what the rest is, uh, is, is typing. Um, but, well, Spark uh, is, is mainly uh, a JVM Scala based Thing. It does support PySpark, uh, Python in PySpark, and it does support R in Sparker, Spark R, whatever way you pronounce that. But it's a different thing. So, well, I was a bit skeptical about this, but uh, we, we started experimenting with that. And it's, and it's good to know a little bit about, about how PySpark works uh, before, we, uh, before we continue. Um, PySpark is a wrapper around Java APIs, in a way, uh, because the majority of Spark is still in the JVM. If you use PySpark, you, for the majority of, uh, of, of the application lifetime, it, it, it does work in, uh, in the JVM, in, in Scala code, basically. Um, but you can write your uh, map functions, your filter functions, your group buys or whatever things you want to do on Spark in Python itself. So that's executed uh, in a C Python interpreter. So in this image, you have these worker nodes where an executor lives, which is related to your application. Circling sort of around that executor is a number of C Python interpreters, one for every processor that you claim. There's a master C Python interpreter where these executors are, are, are forked off out of, uh, and, and that's sort of where the work goes on. Um, yeah, and it, and, it, and it works, and it works quite nicely, uh, but still, it, this, this mix of Java and, uh, and Python is something to, to reckon with, especially if you want to do something with Cassandra. <laughs> Um, it uses pickle, uh, not, not, not that pickle. It, it uses the serialization, serialization uh, module from the Python language, or actually it's, it's well, language or it's format 
for communicating between C Python uh, and the JVM. Um, yeah, that's that's something to, to, to deal with. Um, it uses C pickle where it can. If you're using Python 2.7 or just pickle in Python 3, uh, which is fairly fast but can't do everything, and it uses cloud pickle for the things that normal pickle can't. You can ship things like a lambda function or, or what have you, which normal pickle can't. But cloud pickle is not written in C, so it's way, 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 way slower than normal pickle is. And on the JVM, there is a project called pi for j which is used for pickling stuff to C point. And it works. <laughs> um, when I built PySpark Cassandra, I, I had my issues with, uh, with this. It wasn't, wasn't easy to build. Because when I started uh, at my, uh, my company, we didn't do that much of distributed processing at all. <coughs> we had big boxes and lots of memory. And still, we, we solved certain problems just throwing a, a terabyte of what RAM to it, and, and, and then we, we solved stuff. Uh, we're big users of, uh, of SK Learn, scikit so Learn, and, and well, you can do a lot with, with memory. And, and, we can train a model, and if it takes a couple of days, uh, at least if the number of iterations over the model and the parameters aren't too big, then well, we're sort of, sort of okay, and we can ship a model which, which can be deployed distributedly, and, and then, then things are uh, things are fine. Um, but we were getting more and more problems where things were getting tight, and the box needed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The usual story. So I was looking at, uh, at options, and, and Spark for us was uh, was one of them. Uh, but at the same time, we also use Cassandra quite a lot uh, for time series. Cassandra is, is well, not a bad choice. Let me put it that way, uh, and, and that's what we did. We, we threw a lot of, uh, of time series data to uh, to Cassandra, um, and that was what a year ago or something like that. And there was really no option to use both. So I did my first experiments on uh, on Spark and Cassandra in, in in Scala, and they were quite successful, but. Well, the bridge was uh, was missing, so that's that's what I um, set out to to build, basically becoming PySpark Cassandra. Basically, what it what it does is uh, it gives you uh, distributed Cassandra table scanning into our DDs. We have these resilient distributed data sets of what tuples or digs or whatever is in your RDDs and uh, with PySpark Cassandra you have distributed tables scanning to, well, to fill them basically. So you have an RDD populated by rows, SQL, CQL uh, rows from, from Cassandra. And you can write them back, that's usual, of a useful a lot of times. Uh, you can uh, combine it with DStreams with uh, the streaming option in Spark. Uh, is a lot of streaming users here, or? Yeah, I see someone nodding. Uh, so you can also write back uh, Spark streams to, uh, to Cassandra, and you can join. There is no join in Cassandra. Uh, I, at, at some point in time, I was at a Cassandra meetup at ING here in Amsterdam, and there was a guy from Datastax, and he came from Oracle, and. At Oracle, he was responsible for figuring out how to deal with distributed databases, and well, he learned that's at least what he said that you don't do distributed joins. And so they, they then he went to to data stacks. That was sort of his epiphany, and then he went to data stack. Uh, joins are costly, obviously, uh, especially if uh, if you have a model like uh, like Sandra join. Cheap, but that, that doesn't mean they they aren't useful. PySpark is on the, uh, g gives you joins in uh, in, in PySpark, uh, both for RDDs. So you load a data set from HDFS, from Elastic, from Cassandra itself, and you can join with something in Cassandra, um, but also with DStreams, with uh, Spark Streams. So you have a bunch of events coming in from centers or clicks or whatever, and then you can join with and that, that user table. So you have usernames in a, in a click stream and you want to know what the email address is for some reason. Then you can join with that email 
uh, or use an empty email uh, table and get the get the email. Or the other way around. You you get you catch my. Uh, where are, what do you want to use that for? Basically, uh, from bulk queries you normally can't. Set. Cassandra doesn't do joins. Neither does it do group buys. If you want, if you, if you have that table of users and you want to, uh, something trivial like counting how many people live in Amsterdam or grouping by a city and seeing how many people live in a certain city, you can't do that. Well, no, you, you don't have the option to scan over a table and grouping by a certain column in that table, unless it's the clustering key. Uh, or it takes way too much time because you decided to do it yourself in a Python script or, or in Java from a single node and you've read in everything and writ uh, you've written your own hash join or nested loop or what have you and it, it just took too much time or too much resources either be it uh, compute power or, or just manpower. Um, so do queries you normally can't do on Cassandra, that's something you can use it for. Uh, data wrangling is a lot of things that we do. Uh, as I said, a lot of the uh, solutions we build, we often do still build on big boxes, but many of the data science stuff we, uh, you do, you build on a big feature table or something like that. Uh, and if these features come from various tables in Cassandra, you need to do something to sort of pre-cook that into something that's digestible for SKLR and something like that. Um, and as a streaming platform, stream processing platform. Um, a little bit about what we're using it for. Uh, we use it as a data wrangling, I don't know if that's even a word, I think it's a buzzword, uh, for um, a project in the Media me, me, metadata. Uh, we have a bunch of papers, uh, journal papers, where we want to figure out uh, which author author is which and what is his track, track record. So you've written 13 papers and you, you put your name on it and all the three affiliations over your career that you've been affiliated to. But how can we tell that all these 13 papers were yours and that you don't have people with the same? Name. That, that's sort of the job that we did in order to build all, all sorts of recommenders or what have you models on top of that. Uh, and it wasn't even that much in hundreds of gigabytes. It wasn't, it wasn't huge, but we wanted to use it uh, also in a graph sort of way. So we looked into uh, Cassandra as a, as a basis for doing graph uh, traversals uh, based on Titan. Um, and we use PySpark Cassandra for, for doing the data rendering. Uh, the actual training a model and that sort of stuff uh, was done on, on the big box solution. Uh, earthquake monitoring, we're building a system. Uh, I'm from Groningen, so that kind of makes sense probably. Uh, for for uh, monitoring vibrations uh, with a lot of tiny, cheap sensors in people's homes. Uh, and we're using PySpark Cassandra for enriching the event stream, so we get an ID from a device, but we don't know what that device is, so we join with a table with device data, and then we have a richer event stream, we save that stream, we do some processing on that, anomaly detection, that sort of, uh, that sort of things, um, and a bunch of, uh, bunch of book, book processing. Uh, energy, music, I, I told about before, uh, we're doing all sorts of data wrangling, uh, rolling up data, so we combine weeks of millisecond time series into hourly time series, that sort of stuff, roll-ups. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a coarse tool, but it, but it, but it does work. Uh, for historical purposes, you get a lot less data. Uh, we do some forecasting on that, anomaly detection here as well. So that, that's sort of the stuff where we use PySpark Cassandra for. I'm not saying that PySpark Cassandra is the only or the best tool for doing this sort of stuff, but if you're tied to Cassandra and Python, this is at least one thing to put on the, on the table. 
Now, none of you were high spark Cassandra users, but if after this evening you would be tempted to at least try, maybe. Uh, check out github.com slash target holding slash high spark Cassandra. Uh, it's installable as a Spark package uh, from Spark packages that are by data spark, uh, data bricks, sorry. Uh, and also definitely read the Spark Cassandra connector by data stacks. Because that's what I'm building on. Uh, as for compatibility, um, I don't have the muscle to have a bunch of versions lying around and supporting uh, old stuff that we're not using ourselves anymore and uh, porting back features to old versions and that sort of thing. So, so I'm a bit gung ho on that. I'm, I'm on uh, Spark 1.5 and 1.6 for, uh, for Spark, uh, by Spark Cassandra. Uh, there are older versions that work on 1.3 and 1.4 and 2 more, I think, also. Uh, but currently, I support uh, re uh, the thing supports 1.5 and 1.6. Uh, Cassandra from 2.15 to 2 and up. Uh, Python currently also 2.7 and 3. That wasn't easy, but and then it wasn't because of the Python code, it was because of the packaging also. Um, okay, high overview, maybe you already got this. This is, this is sort of similar to what, what Spark normally does. You, uh, you, you co-locate <coughs> Spark with whatever you're working with. So if you have HDFS, you co-locate Spark with uh, your data nodes. Yeah. And in this case, you, you, if you work with Spark Cassandra or the combination of Spark and Cassandra in general, uh, you co-locate um, Cassandra with Spark Workers, or the other way around, depending on where you're coming from. Um, and somewhere there's a Spark Master, either, or maybe in Mesos, or in whatever way you deploy it. Uh, we're, we're running on standalone Spark, made more sense. We're deploying Cassandra, and Cassandra on Mesos didn't make that much sense for us. And, we don't do Hadoop, so we don't do Yarn. So, so we went for for standalone with a Zookeeper cluster and uh, for uh, for our Spark clusters. And they're doing high availability standalone master, and that that works just uh, just fine. That that sort of gives you the high over deployment perspective on Spark. Um, um, yeah, this, this is where you, if you if you build such a thing, you, you, you notice that it's not so straightforward building on, on PySpark because it's this two, thi two things. Um, so PySpark has a Python part and a Scala part. It started off with Java, but Scala on, on Spark made, made more sense. Um, and they talk to each other via Pickle, not the green one. Um, and then the Scala part talks through the DataStack Spark connector uh, to Cassandra, and that's distributed uh, in, in a Spark cluster, co-located with the Cassandra cluster. So you have two JVMs, and uh, on, on each node, on each uh, virtual machine or physical machine, uh, and NC Python interpreters around that, uh, one for every executor you claim in the cluster. Question. Is it collocated? Is it sort of that uh, Spark gets the data from the Sandra uh, pre loopback interface? Is that basically TCP oriented or how is that connection? Is this a question? Yeah, yeah, I understand the question. Um, it uses the Java Sandra driver. Yeah. Um, it has a notion about the token ring, about the key space in Cassandra. So if you uh, place the Cassandra JVM and the Spark JVM on the same node, then the Java uh, driver can figure out uh, A, which data center is in, uh, data center as in the concept within Cassandra. Mm -hmm. So you can have an operational data center with replication factor three, and if one goes, a node goes down, then your app continues working and that asynchronously uh, being replicated to a, an analytical data center. So it knows that it's talking to something in one of the Cassandra data centers. Um, and it's latency aware. 
but other than that, there is no direct communication between that Cassandra node and that Spark node. It uses local one as a consistency level by default. If that says anything, that means that it's uh, okay if one of the nodes in the data center is in response. That, that's, that's enough. Uh, but it doesn't give you per se the guarantee that it's getting it from uh, your local Cassandra JVM. When I started off with this, I, I thought, well, why don't you build it in the same JVM? That would be a lot faster because you can directly access SS tables and don't have to go through all this serialization over loopback or whatever. Yeah. <coughs> but it doesn't do loopback, basically. Yep. Oh, sorry. No. No. Uh, no. Because it listens on your public IP address. Usually it does. In a cluster, it normally does. Not on. 127001. Yeah. Not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, this, is a, this is a performance issue in, I think, most of the deployments uh, of Spark. I mean, Spark is a cool thing because you can talk to a lot of stuff, um, but it can talk to a lot of stuff because its integration with a lot of stuff is very lightweight. It often uses a, a driver, a connector, or uh, something to talk with that other thing it's getting data from or writing to, uh, as if it is a normal client for for Cassandra in, or, or ACFS or, or, or whatever. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong about the ACFS. Can, can anyone confirm or correct me on that? Several models. The Spark, Spark on the arm, I think, which might be integrates. Yeah, but then still you have a data node. <coughs> which is a JVM and a Spark node, which is a JVM. So you talk to each other, not in function calls or something fast. Yeah, but, uh, but you can access local blocks. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so you have data locality. You don't have to ship it all over the network. And your OS is probably smart enough to, to do that a lot faster than, than when it's a remote call. But it's not the same as a function call within the JVM or within the same heap or something. Yeah, it's just the opening local file and reading from it, that's it. Mm. Okay. If it's present as a local book. Okay. Okay. Then that's a lot better than this. Because this always involves a driver serializing how to query a, a CQL query to Cassandra, getting a result back and then doing something. Probably you don't want to use PySpark Cassandra if you're just if you just want to, or Spark Cassandra uh, for that matter, if you just want to store flat files, then it, then it doesn't make sense. There needs to be some reason to use Cassandra in the first place, and then you want to do some processing over that, and then Spark might, might come in. So it's We're looking for the sweet spot, like yeah. 250 gigabytes, probably okay, if that device, probably not. Uh, we don't have it anyway, so no. uh, this will probably super smart. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, Cassandra petabytes, yeah. big, if you ask me. Yeah. I'm not from DataStacks, maybe they will tell me something different. Uh, well, getting started is rather easy, at least if you don't want to build it yourself. Um, there, there is a, a distribution, target mode slash, pine spark Cassandra, colon, uh, 035, that's the version I'm currently on, uh, on, uh, on Spark packages. Uh, that's sort of the distribution platform provided by Databricks, uh, apart from normal Maven distribution of uh, Java kind of things. Uh, you can figure where uh, your Spark cluster lives, or at least the number of seed nodes, so one of them should be up, and then Spark will learn the topology of your, uh, of your cluster. You can configure your Spark master and that sort of stuff. Um, and there is a Cassandra Spark context which you can create, which is just like a normal Spark context, but it has uh, one extra method, which is Cassandra table. You can also start in shell, and there do something really dirty. If you import PySpark Cassandra, it hijacks your SC variable and shoves a Cassandra table function in it. Which makes things a lot easier. It's dirty, but it, but it makes things a lot easier. So import PySpark Sonata and then you're good to go. So. 
<coughs> so far for the for the high over introductionary part, is that can, can you follow that? Is that a, are we good to go? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I understand that Lambda is a good match for even stores, time series sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm referring to the slide, where, uh, the disapprobation slide, where you were going through 90 million dummies. Yeah. Um, given that that's pretty static, yeah. and uh, also given that for storing one byte of data, CFS, the Cassandra file system, is much more costly than SDFS. Why do you choose to have this data in Cassandra rather than in SDFS? Yeah, good question. Uh, for so starts, you, we're not using CFS. We're just using plain Cassandra. So, so it's not Cassandra file system was something that was built on top of Cassandra, right? Yeah. Uh, mimicking HDFS, but then on Cassandra. Yeah. Uh, we, we're using plain vanilla. Cassandra, we have uh, CQL tables with columns not that wide. Uh, for time series, we're using <coughs> wide rows. So we have a sensor ID as a, as a partition key, and then a timestamp as a clustering column, and then you have a lot of timestamps and values in one partition. This is rather narrow. We have a document with what is uh, on average 10 authors or something like that. That's, that's on average, how wide our, uh, our rows are. Getting back to your question, why to use Cassandra? Why? Well, we wanted to traverse uh, basically what is the graph of scientific publications. So if we have distilled the persons from these authorships, so you have a, a paper <coughs> has 10 authorships, and we distill uh, persons from all these authorships, then we want to be able to traverse uh, that that graph of uh, of persons, their publications, their co-authors, etc., etc., their organizations, that sort of stuff. Um, basically, a graph database type of thing. And I experimented with a lot of graph databases. I wasn't uh, that amused. Um, and we used Cassandra quite a lot. Uh, and. As I told you before, this primary index gives you rather fast uh, lookup of uh, a record in Cassandra if you have its primary key. So if, if you have an identifier of a person in that, uh, in that graph, you can go to its track record, which is, which is a bit wider row, and then get the document IDs of all uh, its publications, and then go back to Cassandra again and get all the uh, co-authors uh, he wrote with, in comparison to uh, uh, at least what I didn't see working that well with HDFS, where I don't have this fairly fast point access into the database. That was the reason why we chose Cassandra for this use case. Whether I'm happy with that, it's it's okay. It's uh, it's working quite well for us, but. It's debatable, yeah. It's not not that obvious. Yeah? Uh, did, oh, sorry, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, I just had a supplement to that. Yeah. If you had to re-implement that question, uh, re-implement the architecture mm -hmm. again, would you still choose Cassandra or would you go for Mapleday? Well, if, if, if I was more successful with these uh, these graph da databases I tried over, or with one I didn't try, uh, then maybe not. If you catch my trick. <laughs> The yeah. question was a bit in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Are you using Python from tutorials? I, I started off with Titan and it was awful. Uh, my ETL, it, it would take, what was it, 160 days or something like that to get it in. Because we're a Python group. And we started off with some quite horrible Python driver and it uses the REST interface and it was really, really, really slow. And the Titan data model does uh, not have an easy way of item potent writes. So if you write the same thing twice, then it will get in your database twice because it will just be a new node or a new vertex. And I'm misusing Cassandra here. If you write something to Cassandra with the same primary key, it just updates or overwrites your original data. So I could do my ETL if it 
falls flat on its face midway the ETL. I can just run it again and I don't know if I was halfway or two thirds. Or that, that made things a, a whole lot easier. I, I did consider Titan. Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. And by experimenting with Titan, I felt somewhat confident that I could mimic its functionality on top of Katana. That would take me more man days to implement because using um, Titan with its uh, uh, with Gremlin on top would be a lot easier uh, to implement. Yeah, one question. Do you think that uh, Spark gave you more experience with Spark versus Titan? Because Titan is more You ended up? Ended up writing on to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the comment is if you use Spark, you have some flexibility to get data from different sources and combine it. Yeah. Well, I agree. agree. Okay. Getting back to the hard part. Uh, this, th these are, are basically the things you can do with PySpark or Sandra or Spark or Sandra. Uh, it, it sort of feels like we're in a <laughs> relational algorithm 101 or something like that. You can, you can scan, uh, you can project or select, uh, you can filter, at least to some extent. Uh, there's a thing called limit. Um, you can count um, the thing called spanning, which is a bit like grouping. But different. Uh, you can join and you can <coughs> save. That was the method I was talking about that I uh, not so nicely injected into your SC variable when you imported PySpark Cassandra. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gives you access to an RDD filled with Cassandra uh, CQL rows. Um, in order to give you that, it determines uh, your, your basic token range. So, as I said, each and every Cassandra node is responsible for a part of your key space. Um, it determines that, it reads that from uh, your cluster. Um, Cassandra currently has a size estimate. For each and every token range, there is an estimate of the number of partition keys and the number of bytes for that token range. Uh, and use that information to group your token ranges into Spark RDDs. Because you don't want your Spark RDDs too big, because then your Spark JVM or CPark thing interpreters take so much memory that they fall flat on the face because, well, you need to go cheap. Um, so, so it uses that information to build partitions uh, into your RDD. So if you have a bunch of data in a table, you get more partitions, uh, and if you have less, then you get less partitions. And it uh, assigns, well, there's a feature in Spark called, it's called uh, preferred locations or something like that, which is a feature of, um, of an RDD, which answers the question, to which uh, Spark worker should I assign this partition? And it uses the token range information it got from the Cassandra cluster to assign a partition to uh, Spark Worker, which is co-located with uh, Cassandra node, which is responsible for that token range. Mouthful? But <coughs> yeah? So, uh, sorry, question. Yeah. How, how do you handle a modification of underlying uh, Cassandra table? You get RDD, but RDD should be immutable. Yeah. What if your data in Cassandra changed during your processing and everything. You shouldn't care. Uh, if you do, well, what if then I'm you're going down the wrong path. I mean, uh, it's, it's not like you get uh, some sort of um, snapshot of, uh, of the data in your Cassandra database. So okay. if your table is written to at the time you're reading with Spark, 
then your partitions, uh, the data in your partitions depend on when that partition is processed. Okay, but uh, I can have any guarantee about data consistency. For example, if I modify uh, some key in the beginning of table and uh, some key at the end of the table, mm -hmm. I just have no idea what kind of data I'm, I'm processing can be random. Well, not random, but... You can have any, any behavior. <laughs> Well, depending on you, you at least know that you're reading all the data that was in when you started reading, and uh, after you're done reading, uh, the data that will come in then won't be in your data set. That, that's that what you know. So you need to do stuff on the application level to deal with that. If you want to do a roll-up of uh, historic data or something like that, you use the clustering column in Cassandra to bound on, say, uh, from yesterday to two weeks ago. And that's that's your uh, slice of data you're you're taking. And if in the meantime there's data coming in, you assume that it's newer data because well, it's not yesterday anymore. Then you deal with that on the application layer. Uh, but there there are cases where, where this is where this is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you have if you would have a more integrated solution, you could say well, I take a snapshot. In Cassandra, Cassandra has a thing called a snapshot, and then it flushes at that point in time all mem tables to disk, and then you have a sort of semi, at least on one node, you have a consistent view of your cluster. And if you take the snapshots everywhere at sort of the same time, you have a more consistent view than you would have by not doing that. But well. actually, I'm, I'm not familiar with Cassandra, but I'm familiar with the edge base, and the edge base is very similar to Cassandra in idea and the internal organization. Mm -hmm. And they try to uh, handle this situation with internal timestamps. So every key value has a timestamp. And when you start scanning, you just remember when you started to do this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you just you skip over everything you, after. Yeah, yeah. You, you just reject in your uh, entries. But yeah. it's an optional feature. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, not in there. Uh, they're, they are similar. Uh, Cassandra also does have timestamp uh, of when a cell is written. It uses that for conflict resolution. So if you write in three nodes, and uh, then then you use that timestamp to 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 resolve conflicts. But it, it isn't used. No. But it's just for the sake of time and flow that we save. Yeah. Around. Yeah. Good. And then. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so basically, you're you're executing this uh, query quite uh, quite often. Each and every partition in uh, Cassandra RD is filled with the results from uh, a number, uh, at least one, but uh, usually a number of these uh, queries. So you divide up that token range over the partitions in your RDD, uh, and you use that token range to bound on the primary key of a table. Uh, and you have some, you, you can order by your ripple limit and that sort of stuff, but that, that's, that's basically, yeah, that's basically it. Um, there are things to, to tune. Uh, split count will give you uh, a certain size of uh, your RDD in terms of partitions. So it's, uh, here it says, give me 1,000 partitions, or you can make it 10 or whatever. That would make uh, bigger or smaller uh, partitions. Uh, split size does something similar, but it, there you say I want each and every partition to be about that size in megabytes. Fetch size is uh, the amount of uh, SQL rows you get in every query. Uh, the consistency level we, we discussed about. Uh, by default, it, it's local one, uh, but but that that may be uh, may be an issue. At some point in time, I uh, increased the replication factor. Uh, in a Cassandra cluster, but it wasn't done repairing it yet, so not every node had all the data, and then I started reading with consistency level local one, and a bunch of data was missing. So, well, local one is, uh, is fine, but not all. Uh, your basic prediction or selection, if you don't want to read everything, don't, don't read everything. You can select the columns you want to read. 
uh, it's say maybe not so much in Disk.io. Uh, usually you, you do read a, a, a lot of data from uh, Disk anyway, or from your page cache. Uh, but it saves you a lot of uh, CPU cycles, mostly uh, in the communication between Cassandra, the Spark JVM, and CPython. Again, that communication path is rather CPU intensive. Because of the serialization? Yeah, yeah. Any idea how what CPU percentage goes to serialization for instance? Uh, I, I can't put a number on that. No, no. Uh, tens. Tens. I mean, it's not like ninety percent is. A, of course, it also depends on what you're doing with the data. I mean, if you're reading, if you're reading uh, a gigabyte and then. Uh, you're iterating over that gigabyte many, 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 many times. Then obviously that so it sort of depends a bit on what you're. Uh, well, a lot of types are supported. Uh, I think I probably can share the, the pre presentation afterwards. Yeah. All of the the SQL types are supported. Then they're mapped to a Python type similar to the Python Cassandra. Uh, driver, uh, except for UDTs, user-defined types, like, uh, sort of like a struct-like concept in Cassandra and that's mapped to a, to a custom type, a bit like a named tuple. Um, you can create uh, a key-valued RDD uh, where you say, well, I have a, a table with a primary key and a bunch of columns. Uh, with this uh, function, it would be an RDD of uh, primary key and the rest of the columns uh, elements. Um, yeah, there, there, there is a bit of filtering you can do with Cassandra, not a lot. As I said, it's, it's not something built on a B plus tree or, or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so you're limited to where you can normally apply where. So if a secondary index or it's on the clustering column or it's on the primary uh, key, then you can filter. Otherwise, you have to use filter uh, from Spark itself. If you use filter from Spark itself, it means read everything into Spark and then filter within your CPython interpreter. Uh, and if you filter out 10%, that's okay. If you filter out 90%, then you're doing something wrong. That, that, that's that's basically, uh, basically it. Uh, but th this, this gives you uh, a means to, say, uh, slice over the last week uh, in rolling up a time series, that sort, of, uh, that sort of stuff. You specify uh, your clustering column, the timestamp in the time series has uh, the key you're, uh, you're filtering on, where the where clause applies to, uh, and it has to be bigger than uh, now minus 14. Uh, if you have fancy secondary indexes, of course you can uh, you can do you can do more. Uh, not not cheap per se, but uh, can be can be very uh, very convenient. This is this is Lucene from Statio uh, tacked onto tacked onto. Um, yeah, limit and take just for convenience. Um, sometimes you I, I use. PySpark a lot in, in the shell, just to experiment with, uh, with some function I'm, I'm writing. And sometimes I have several uh, hundreds of gigabytes I'm processing over, and I don't want to process over everything, so I just get the first record and apply my function to it. And then I don't have to load everything in and then apply that function and, and to figure out that it doesn't work four hours later. Uh, I just get the first row. Or uh, limit. That also works where a limit is a funny thing. It's not like saying, give me an RDD of size one. A limit gives you that for every query asked to Cassandra, there is a, 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 at most that much results return. Uh, but it, it, um, so it's, it's a bit uh, flaky, but it, but, it, but it works. If you have these uh, several gigabytes tables uh, and you say, well, I have. Um, of 500 queries asked to Cassandra, because that's how your partitions are uh, are, are cut up into into queries. And you say limit one, then you get a RD of 500 elements, and that, that that sort of gives you something to to, to experiment with. 
being rather rather like uh, Cassandra counts pushes down counts to Cassandra um, speaks for itself probably spanning uh, well it's a bit like group by. Uh, but you use it for wide rows. Cassandra has something called wide row where you have a partition key and a clustering column, say for time series, you, when you look at a table, it says, say, center ID time segment of value. Uh, for center ID blah, at point in time X, value was Z. Um, usually you store that as a, as a wide row where the center ID is your primary, is your partition key, and your time sample is your clustering column. So within one partition for one sensor, you have all the time series for the time series data for that single sensor. Uh, with HighSpark Cassandra, you have the guarantee that each and every of that those wide rows uh, is read in order. So if your database says uh, T1, T2, T3, T4 for one time series, then they would be consecutive in that RDD. So if you would iterate over that RDD, they would be in the same order. And you're guaranteed that uh, such a wide row would not span partitions. So you have to do something uh, specialized in mapping a partition instead of mapping an element. Uh, you know that, that they are uh, consecutive. Span by utilizes that. Basically, it gives you group by over the primary, or sorry, over the partition key. Uh, but very efficient. If you would use group by from Spark, that would mean that you would shuffle all your data to other nodes within your Spark cluster, shuffling your entire data set all across your cluster while it was already in the right spot. Because you wanted to group by primary key and, uh, sorry, by partition key, and every, da uh, every data point associated with that partition key was already at the right spot. So span by gives you sort of a group by over part uh, partition, partition key, but, but very, very cheap. Uh, relating to that uh, uh, media mining document stuff, say I want all the authors uh, for a document in one, uh, one list, uh, and then I want to iterate over these lists of authors, then I can span by the document ID, because that would be the primary key of these authors. Saving back, um, basically you can save everything uh, in Spark back to Cassandra for as long as it's uh, composed of tuples. So we have an RD of tuples, or we have an RD of dicts, dictionaries, maps, or whatever you want to call it, um, or uh, row objects, which are which is a class from from PySpark Cassandra, very similar to uh, the row object from PySpark SQL. Small example, uh, say you would have uh, that RDD <coughs> of, uh, of three dictionaries, you would parallelize that to be sent out into the cluster, you could call safety Cassandra on that, on, on every arbitrary RDD, uh, as long as you have imported price park yeah. Again, something dirty, I hijack the RDD class from. Um, for time's sake, I won't go uh, into details that much further. Uh, there's a bunch of tuning you can uh, you can do. How big your batches are when you're writing. I've seen Cassandra clusters fall over because there was just a shitstorm of of writes uh, hitting it from uh, from Spark. So, so you might want to, to tune that, uh, especially if you have multiple tenants on on that same cluster. Um, yeah, and you can save a D stream. So read from. Uh, Kafka, uh, do some transformation on it, join it with a uh, Cassandra table, and then save it to uh, save it to Cassandra. Join. Well, um, not not that difficult probably. Uh, for now, uh, no, sorry. You can join on the partition key or on the primary key, uh, or any combination of the partition key and some of the clustering columns as long as they're in the right order uh, and you can select which columns to uh, to yield in the, in the join. It's only an inner join. That has bitten me. Uh, at some point in time I needed a left join. 
and that wasn't fun. You said earlier that the joints would be uh, highly time consuming. Yeah. Is this just, say, sugar that you create this highly time consuming thing, or is it more efficient than, say, the. the it's still rather time consuming. If you're joining several gigabytes left to several gigabytes, terabytes right, then that, that's a time consuming thing. Uh, in, in, in relational databases, you, you often join rather sele selectively. So you have uh, one uh, row left and you want to join it with the 13 rows right or something like that. Th this gives you a join over a full table scan left or a full table scan right. So or it's still fairly slow. Sorry? It's typically slow. Yeah, this, 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 this quickly takes hours, depending on your data size. Obviously, if you have 10 records left and 10 yeah, records right, it's fast. But, um, it's, it, it behaves similar to uh, hash join. What, you, what is done is that for every record in the RDD you're joining with Cassandra, a query goes out. So you're iterating over the, the RDD and you're reading randomly from, uh, from Cassandra. So, 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 so that is uh, that is rather uh, it's it's cheaper uh, than using Spark join. Yeah, that was sort of my question. So it's a lot cheaper than doing a Spark join. If you would select Cassandra table uh, two times, have two RDDs, and then use the join function from from Spark, that that would be horrible. Because then you would shuffle. Both data sets based on their primary key to somewhere, well, where they not necessarily need to be. Uh, and if your data set is bigger than memory, you have to write it to, to disk and uh, all, all sorts of so this is hard things pop horrible. up. So, so it's less horrible. It's, I mean, this is not something you, you do for millisecond queries or something like that. But again, depending on how much you have on your left side. For, for streaming applications, it, this uh, is very useful. Uh, then the amount of queries to Cassandra is, is simply a function of the amount of events or uh, elements streaming through your uh, D-stream. Uh, but if you join two RDDs or if you join Cassandra with an RDD, that typically is a, it's an expensive operation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but definitely cheaper than uh, than your normal join. Sometimes if left or right is very small, uh, you might as well just uh, select the RDD, uh, pull it to your driver and broadcast it into your cluster. Uh, and then use map partition or whatever to, to do the, 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 the broadcast join. Um, there is a thing called repartition by Cassandra replica in the Spark Cassandra connector which I haven't implemented just yet. That's a feature where the left RDD gets shuffled to where uh, the data you want to join with is. So you only have to shuffle left uh, to where right is and then your join is rather cheap because you can just locally uh, read. Um, yeah, and you have SKU and, and, and the normal to, uh, to wrap up future work, um, well, when I started this, data frames were, uh, were announced. They weren't there yet, they were announced. Um, Spark, the Sandra connector now has data frames uh, built in. And it gives you an alternative for using uh, Cassandra with, uh, with PySpark. Yeah, and the data frame is, is uh, rather efficient. I mean, it's a lot of more efficient than having Python th tuples being pickled all over the place. It, it, it is uh, similar, I think, uh, in, in, in technology uh, to, to a pandas data frame or NumPy arrays. So if you filter something rather sele selectively, or well, if you filter at all, if you filter in, in a pandas data frame, it's a lot faster than if you filter in a list of dictionaries. And the same goes for uh, Python RDDs of tuples or dicts or what have you versus uh, filtering in the data frame. So uh, future work, well, for, for the main engine, I'm now relying on 
raw RDDs. Um, I am considering switching over to uh, to data frames. On the other hand, I've seen uh, big, better performance when using uh, the raw Python Cassandra driver. Uh, then I would have to implement a lot of the, the Spark stuff and the Spark Cassandra connector stuff all over again. So I'm not that, that fond of that. Uh, especially because the C Python interpreters are killed after every job. So for every job you would have to reconnect with your Spark, uh, Cassandra cluster and the overhead involved in that. So, all right. Uh, more features, repartitioning, uh, as I said just, uh, just now, multiple clusters. Uh, I want to be able to read and write from multiple or two multiple Cassandra clusters. Could be easy for migrations or something like that. Say you have a new cluster somewhere uh, in the cloud or you, you went in-house or whatever, you could fairly efficiently copy over, at least efficiency uh, in terms of how much code uh, you would need to write that sort of thing. Um, and something to expose the, the Cassandra connector, the session itself, to, uh, to Python. To implement that left join I just discussed, I had to connect for every partition with the Cassandra cluster and do the left join myself. And all this connection stuff, and there's a bunch of overhead I, I, I don't want. So, um, not, not for now, not for the big group discussion, but if you have suggestions, uh, let, let me know. Yeah, we're hiring as well. Uh, one final round of questions and then uh, liquids. Anyone? Or are we done? Uh, so, uh, so the, is, there a, is that already a community around this project? Who could you keep saying I and Well, I'm, I'm the, the primary maintainer. Um, there is a guy from Opera, uh, Opera Poland. Uh, they use Cassandra for storing their bookmarks, and he's running analytics on their bookmarks uh, cluster. Uh, he's been quite helpful. He's answering uh, issues on uh, on GitHub, that sort of uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, he's sending in pull requests and a bunch of others that also have sent uh, pull requests, but it's. Uh, it's a small community. There's let, let, room, let, room for growth. There's room for growth. <laughs> most, uh, most of it. Yes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, I'm open for pull requests, and if someone is really committed, uh, taking up maintainership is, uh, is just fine by me. Uh, <laughs> uh, Code maintainership. I don't, I don't want to drop it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, shoot. For which type of use case? So, all the examples you've given me, mm -hmm. I'm thinking like, I can think of quite some technologies where you could solve this probably, for me, in, an, in a way which is less from the parts. Yeah. Uh, what's, a typical, what's a typical feature or a typical use case you'd be looking at where you say, well, this is where we really excel on top of everything else? Because I, I, I like what you presented that. Yeah. I'm struggling finding that spot where this would Maybe not select something else for that specific So, in general, why the combination of Spark and Cassandra? Or well, no, okay, I, I, I get the, the, the advantages of using a column store for time series, mm -hmm. with, and there is typical that various solutions for that problem, right? Yeah. Um, the examples you're giving are actually the fridge you're looking at, the stringer, I, I am actually struggling to think why this would be. I'm trying to find like the, the actual use case where this would excel over over alternative technologies. Yeah. I wonder what, what your list is. Uh, my primary view is that uh, if Cassandra is a good fit uh, for your main operations, right? so you're saving time series and that sort of stuff, uh, but you do want to do analytics over that, then I think this is an option with uh, the least moving parts. I think, well, m maintaining cluster with, uh, with Spark and, and Cassandra is it's not that difficult. Mm. Um, so if you have a combination of that, that's, that, that sort of, for, for me, is a, a sweet. Um, 
the, the, the media stuff I showed earlier, <laughs> odd one, perhaps. But if you would, for instance, compare this, if that's your example with something like where I would probably go if I would want to do that, mm -hmm. where is this then? Yeah, I've considered doing it, but uh, Cassandra gives me a lot more flexibility to store other stuff as well. Uh, so if I would go for only time series, then then, then maybe Druid would be okay. Uh, but if I want to store a bunch of other stuff just as well, then uh, the Cassandra data model is, is, a, is a lot richer. Okay, so it's, it's for, for slightly wider versatility than, than something which is specifically focused at one of the problem dimensions, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe versatility is what, well, how versatile is Cassandra? I mean, if you compare it to Elasticsearch or something like that, then... <laughs> yeah. Did you find yeah. a specific use for the Swiss Army knife? Yeah. Well, this is not a Swiss Army knife. So, okay, let, let's, uh, let's wrap up. Wrap up. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for paying attention uh, and, uh, and your kind questions. Uh, you haven't killed me, so uh, good. <laughs> Still fine. Great.